on the bridge, the bridge is subjected to vibrations. And uh, sometimes these vibrations can lead to catastrophic consequences. So that may be in the form of the failure of the bridge itself or just the discomfort to the passengers who are moving in those vehicles which are moving or it may be just derailment in case of uh, a railway bridge. So we will first understand that what is the source of those vibrations, why the vibrations occur when the load is moving over the bridge because the load is not vibrating. The load is uh, uh, moving statically, okay, without any change in its magnitude. But because of the movement of the load itself along the span, we get the vibrations. So this problem was identified as early as in 1847, where one uh, Chester D railway bridge collapsed. And uh, it collapsed, it was a cast iron uh, girder bridge, and uh, the bridge collapsed due to uh, uh, excessive vibrations. So it was known that the failure of the reason of failure was the vibrations. So, and those vibrations were caused due to moving load. And as you can see in this uh, uh, rendering, uh, it is not a photograph. So uh, at that time, perhaps photograph was not available. So somebody has made uh, an artistic view of that. And uh, you can see that the trains have fallen. So this problem of vibrations of the bridges was known. And uh, one more aspect of the vibration of the bridges is that these are causing fluctuating stresses in uh, members, different members. And due to that, in case of steel bridges, there is a problem of fatigue. Actually, fatigue is also a problem. Now, people have found that fatigue is a problem even in case of RCC structures. But it is better known in case of steel structures. And it is also taken into account while designing steel bridges in both the courts. So the effect of these vibrations, what we can, what problems we face due to vibrations. So one is the increased internal forces in the structure, what we take into account through uh, CDA or impact factor. So the dynamic effect in terms of displacement is more. So there is a static displacement under the load. If the load is just placed statically on the bridge, there will be some displacement. Due to this moving effect of the load, the displacement is higher than that so there is an increase in the displacement and the forces in different members are proportional to the displacement so the force is also increased in the same proportion so there is an increase in the forces and we have to design our structures for higher forces this fact is recognized in both railway and bridge design codes and uh, there are factors given impact factor in uh, what is called in highway bridge code IRC codes and CDA in the railway bridge codes. So we multiply the forces which we have obtained from static analysis by these factors and that takes care of the uh, uh, increase in the forces. But this discussion has come up again when we are talking about high speed trains, bullet train is under construction and uh, even on the existing bridges, there is a proposal to increase the speed of the trains. So when we want to increase the speed of the trains, then this question comes that whether the CDA which we are using is applicable for that increased speed or not, or what will happen when the speed is increased, whether using CDA we are on safe side or not. And uh, uh, what will be the fatigue life of the structures when it will be subjected to these uh, uh, increased speed of the trains, what effect it is going to have. And then uh, whether the operation of the trains will be safe on these existing bridges at high speed, up to what speed we can go so that the uh, train movement is safe. Then it can cause local fatigue in the members because the stress, stress level or the fluctuating stress level is going to increase. And these cause vibration deformations and uh, these deformations, as I said, are responsible to the increased forces in the member. And these cause acceleration of the bridge track. So it not only causes uh, displacement, but it causes uh, acceleration. And that acceleration affects the serviceability in both safety, in terms of safety, and in terms of the uh, uh, passenger discomfort. 
so when there is high acceleration because our body is sensitive to acceleration our body is not sensitive to uh, displacement and even to velocity but when acceleration is there our body is very sensitive and uh, when there is an acceleration on the bridge that causes discomfort uh, to the passengers they feel unsafe and uh, if the wheel loses its contact with the rail there can be derailment so if that acceleration is uh, very high it can re it can lead to <coughs> derailment as well and uh, we have to consider the worst case scenario in that case if the frequency of this moving load vibrations due to moving load matches with the frequency of uh, the bridge then it went lead to complete lead uh, complete destruction of the bridge uh, because of the resonance so that situation also is to be avoided so we have to ensure that the resonance condition does not occur so first question which comes to our mind is that why bridges vibrate under moving loads so load is moving along the length it is not changing in time so why the vibration occurs so here i have taken a simple example where there is a simply supported beam this simply supported beam is subjected to a load p and this load p is moving with a velocity so at any time t it will be at a distance equal to v into t from the first support and this load starts from the left support and moves towards the right support let us say the length of the bridge is l so it will take l by v time to cover the whole span so if i take any point let us say mid span here so what will be the effect of this load at mid span so when the load is just at the left support the effect on the mid span will be zero and as the load starts moving towards the left span you know from inference line diagram that the effect at the mid span will go on increasing so displacement uh, moment shear force all will go on increasing at the mid span as the load moves from left support to towards right and then when it crosses the mid span and moves towards right then it then it decreases again so this load will if if i consider it at any point so effect of this load at any point is like an impulse which is increasing reaching the maximum value which is equal to p and then it is decreasing so the behavior is very similar to this uh, single degree freedom system which uh, we all are familiar so spring and mass system it is subjected to a time varying load pt and that variation of this pt is something like this so the total duration is given by td so this td is the time taken by this uh, load to cross the bridge so from starting from the left point going towards right, right point so this time and this will be capital l divided by v the length of the bridge divided by the velocity of movement of the single load so this td is l by v and at td by 2 in the middle the effect will be maximum so this type of load uh, this type of pulse if we apply on this mass which is connected to the spring what type of uh, response we are expecting that problem has been solved in all uh, structural dynamics problems or uh, structural dynamics books and uh, it is also available in ake jofra's book so i have taken this solution from here so what is seen that the response is very much sensitive to the ratio of td by tn where tn is the natural period of vibration of this beam and td is the duration in which the load the single load crosses the bridge so as the td by tn is increasing here it is roughly 0.1 1 by 8 okay so it is close to 1 by 10 so that means the duration is duration of crossing is much smaller to the natural period okay what does that mean that the velocity is quite large so the load quickly moves over the bridge so when the load moves quickly over the bridge the bridge does not get time to respond to that load and in that case the response is going to be small so if the speed is very high then also we are not going to get much response it will be more or less static response and uh, if as td tries or as td approaches towards tn that means the duration in which the load is crossing the bridge and it is uh, Uh, closing towards tn 
then we can see that the response goes on increasing. And at Td by Tn is equal to 1 by 2. So we can see when Td by Tn is equal to 1 by 2, you can think this as the half wave. Okay, so if I uh, complete this triangular wave, so it will it will be going it will be going up like this, then it will be coming back, and then it will go in the negative direction, and then it will come back. So that much will be the one cycle. So it is something like the half period of this loading wave. So when Td by Tn is equal to 1, in that case we can see that the period of the loading and the period of the structure are matching. And in that case, we can see that the maximum response will be obtained. And this continues at Td by Tn equal to 1. There also we get almost the same response. And when the load crosses uh, before Td, I uh, sorry, uh, after Td uh, and Td by Tn is equal to 1, the load has crossed the bridge. In that case, uh, it will the bridge will be subjected to free vibration so response will continue so response will not the bridge will not stop vibrating when the load has crossed the bridge and it will continue this is important when we are thinking uh, about a train of loads so when i have a number of loads following one after the other then what will happen when the first load crosses and goes out of the bridge the bridge is getting some vibrations still it is in the free vibration condition and then the second load comes and second load has this loading phase here and depending on at what interval the second load is coming the vibrations be because of the first load and the vibrations due to the second load can have either constructive or destructive interference so that will depend upon the phase and the phase will depend on when the second load is starting so that's why the gap between the first load and the second load will also be important and uh, the vibrations even when the load has crossed the bridge will continue now when the td is larger than tn so when it becomes 1.5 it is more or less same slightly reduced when td by tn is greater than 2 or equal to 2 you can see that the response is almost the static response so whatever displacement we will get in the static case the same we are going to get and when it is 2.5 and 3 so it depends upon what is the ratio of this td by tn so if td is some multiple of tn then it, it can have uh, some sort of uh, periodic vibrations but when you can see when td is e just equal to tn it is not having any free vibration phase after uh, it crosses the bridge the free vibrations are perfectly stopped. So this ratio of Td by Tn, this is most important. And this decides that what type of uh, vibrations are going to occur in our bridge. Now this is for triangular uh, shape pulse. The same single degree freedom system when it is subjected to, let us say, half sine wave pulse, then what is the response? So under half sine wave also, because in reality, uh, the shape will be smooth so something like this we are going to get so the pulse loading will be somewhat similar to the sine wave and we can see that similar observation is here also so at td by tn is equal to 0.5 we get the maximum response which continues at td by tn equal to 1 also and as td by tn increases beyond 1 the response goes on uh, reducing the dynamic effect of the response goes on reducing so td by tn is uh, suggesting us the ratio of the velocity with respect to the frequency of the uh, structure so if the velocity is small then td by tn will be large so if the uh, load is moving at a slow speed then the response dynamic response is going to be less but when this speed increases and td approaches tn by 2 then uh, the response will be maximum and this response will continue for some more speed so there is a range there in its of speed where we are going to get high response we will look at that when we will talk about the uh, actual bridge and uh, if we obtain response under the single load we can obtain the response under the train of the loads also because our bridge is still in linear range it is vibrating under linear elastic 
behavior. So superposition is valid. So we can obtain the response for one load. Then we can superimpose the load response of the second load with the time gap. And that time gap will depend upon the distance between the two loads. So that distance between the two loads is also very important because whether the two loads will have constructive interference or destructive interference, that will also depend upon the duration and velocity. So the ratio of, sorry, distance between the two loads and the velocity. So uh, the distance is also important. Now we can set an equation of motion for this single moving load. So at any time t, this is uh, nothing but m into mass into acceleration, del square u u by del square t, sorry, del t square, this is acceleration. So second derivative with respect to time, and here the displacement u, u is the displacement of the bridge, that is function of dis, uh, is distance from the support as well as time. So it is function of both x and t, and that's why it can be differentiated with respect to x, it can also be differentiated with respect to t. So differential of this u with respect to t is giving us the acceleration. Differential of this, uh, first differential of this with respect to t is giving us the velocity. So this is mx double dot into cx dot. And this factor is coming. So ei into del square u by del t square. So del square u by del t square is giving us the curvature. And uh, ei into curvature gives us the moment. So this is the second derivative of the moment which is appearing here. So EI del 4 U by, sorry, this is wrong. It should have been X. So del 4 U by del X square. This is a typing mistake. So EI del 4 U by del X square. So this is a derivative in space. These are the derivatives in time. So we can differentiate it in space as well as in time. And then the at any time, the load will be represented by Dirac delta function. So P into this delta and delta function represents a very high value at this uh, uh, value of, uh, uh, of the what is there in the parenthesis. And this is nothing but x minus vt. So uh, vt is the current position. So at vt position, it will have very high value. And at all other locations, it will have very small. So we can solve this differential equation. Uh, this can be solved for single load. And uh, we need some boundary conditions and initial conditions. So boundary conditions are that at both the supports, the displacement is zero as well as the moment is zero, curvature is zero. So u double dot, uh, sorry, u double prime. This is representing uh, the derivative in space with respect to x. So this is representing curvature. u uh, double prime is representing del square u by del x square. So that is curvature. So curvature is zero. That means the moment is zero. And initial condition that at t equal to zero, initially the beam is uh, at rest. So the both the displacement at all the points, at all the values of x is zero. And similarly, the velocity at all the points is zero at t equal to zero. So these are, are our the are our boundary and initial conditions. So we will need these to obtain the coefficients of integration when we will be uh, integrating this equation. So solving that, we can get the response u of the bridge or the simply supported beam in this case under this load p moving at a velocity v. Then uh, the bridge also have the modes of vibration. Okay, so we have seen the modes of vibration in a multi-degree freedom system. So the bridge we can consider either as a continuous system or a system having infinite number of degrees of freedom. So generally when we are modeling it, we will see in the afternoon today. So when we are modeling it, we uh, cannot model with infinite number of degrees of freedom. We make the finite degrees of freedom, but we try to divide this into sufficient small uh, segments. So when we divide it into sufficient small segments, or we can analyze uh, this uh, by solving the equation of motion which we have written. So we can get the shape of the mode, nth mode. So it is like sine n pi x by L. So 
in case of first mode when n is equal to 1 so it will become half sine wave and similarly in case of second mode this will become the full one full sine wave and frequency of vibration can be calculated using this expression this expression has been obtained by considering continuous distribution of mass as uh, i have shown in the previous equation so solving the previous equation we can get the frequency and this frequency depends upon ei of the uh, beam or the bridge and the mass per unit length so this m is mass per unit length l is the span so it is inversely proportional to l square as we understand that as the span uh, will go on increasing the frequency will go on reducing or the period will be longer so a longer bridge will be vibrating with a uh, longer period and if ei is increased that means we make the uh, bridge stiffer so a stiffer bridge will uh, vibrate at higher frequency or with short period so stiffer the bridge the less will be the period for example for the same span if we are having uh, what you call an open web gutter or the truss so a truss bridge uh, is also called open web gutter so if we are having a truss bridge for the same, same span the stiffness is going to be more so the truss bridge is going to have a smaller period as compared to a uh, composite gutter uh, bridge and similarly if the mass is increased keeping ei same if mass more mass is added then also the period will elongate then excitation frequency of the moving load can be obtained simply i told you that the period can be considered as two times td and td we can obtain as l by v so this excitation frequency of the moving load uh, this can be represented as n pi by v where n has values from 1 to any number so th this can also have several harmonics so n is representing which harmonic we are considering and l by v is nothing by td so this is 1 upon td multiplied by pi and uh, because we are converting this into angular frequency so that's why we will have 2 pi and uh, that uh, td by 2 will cancel out that 2 of td by 2 will cancel out from 2 pi here so this is something like angular frequency of moving load so it is not uh, f but it is omega and we define a non-dimensional uh, parameter what we call a speed parameter which is ratio of the loading frequency to the natural frequency of the structure capital omega n by small omega n so this and when we substitute these values this comes out to be v into l divided by n and square root m over ei so for given bridge m upon ei if we take constant so it will depend upon the velocity and l so larger the velocity larger will be the speed parameter and larger the span larger will be the speed parameter so it will depend upon the span and the velocity and this is considered uh, to perform parametric study in most of the literature so just to show you the results here is a case study where a simple beam has been modeled in midas so this beam has been modeled by small segments minimum 20 uh, segments uh, should be used so if we are using 20 segments along the length of the beam those we have found to be adequate but uh, you can find out the number of segments using sensitivity study that how the results are affected as you are making finer and finer meshes so then this load is moved and how the load will be moved it will be acting first at the support then at the next point then at the second point and so on and the time step of integration is also important so the time step of integration has to be sufficiently small in this case in fact in case of uh, moving load problem the time step of integration you will see is much smaller than what we are using in case of seismic uh, excitation so for convergence the time step should be sufficiently small because the period involved of the loading here is also quite small so uh, sometimes the load may be in between these two points also so whatever uh, node points we have here so between the two nodes the load may be acting in that case we can distribute the load effect to the adjacent nodes 
uh, linearly as i have shown it will act like a triangular pulse between those two nodes so we can just move the load from one point to the other and we can perform a dynamic analysis of this uh, bridge under this moving load so the response we will go get will be something like this so when td by tn is 0.1 that means the duration which the load is taking to cross the bridge is quite a small means the velocity is quite large in that case we will get uh, the behavior something like this so this will simply excite the bridge and td by tn equal to 1 means that the one period of the uh, bridge one period of vibration of the bridge has completed here so when td by tn is equal to 1 so so it will start vibrating then if td by tn is equal to 0.5 these have been plotted on the same scale so you can see that the displacement has increased quite a lot here the displacement was roughly 0 0.015 so from, from 0 0.015 it has reached 0 0.07 so when td by tn is equal to 0.5 it has increased and you can see that this is maximum here and when td by tn is equal to 1 it continues like we have seen in case of a single degree freedom system something similar behavior we see that uh, from td by tn is equal to 0.5 to 1 in this range we are getting the maximum response and when the td crosses tn that means the velocity is reduced so at td by tn is equal to 1.5 we can see that there are hardly any vibrations uh, the displacement is, is small and same is applicable in case of td by td by tn is equal to 2 so the load is acting more or less statically okay but this is about the displacement displacement sometimes may not give the correct picture let us look at the acceleration so acceleration is changing like this if td by tn is equal to 0.1 we have acceleration varying almost sinusoidally because of the free vibrations mode at td by tn is equal to 0.5 the increase in acceleration is even more so from 0.5 meter per second square it goes up to 2.5 meter per second square so we can see that the acceleration increases five times and this increased acceleration can be a problem and this is representing td by tn is equal to 0.5 this is representing the resonance condition so the velocity corresponding to this will cause the maximum acceleration and there is a possibility that under this acceleration the load loses its contact or the wheel loses the contact with the rail and there may be derailment and uh, when the td by tn is increased that means the velocity is reduced further we we can see that still there are higher accelerations but these accelerations are not as high as td by tn equal to uh, 0.5 then when the td by tn is increased further that means the load is moving slowly the acceleration reduces further and you can see as the velocity becomes smaller and smaller the uh, acceleration of the bridge goes on reducing now uh, the worst condition is we have seen when td by tn is uh, close to 0.5 so there we have what we call resonance condition so resonance condition occurs when the exciting frequency is close to one of the natural frequencies of the bridge so this situation we have to avoid and we can have uh, a primary resonance uh, where the uh, exciting frequency is matching with the natural the fundamental natural frequency of the bridge so when it is close to fundamental natural frequency we call it primary resonance and primary resonance is the main point of concern because the maximum response will occur when our exciting frequency is uh, matching with the fundamental frequency because fundamental frequency of the bridge is having or the fundamental mode of the bridge is having the maximum participation in its response so this is the major problem and the speed corresponding to this can be calculated as omega 1 into d over 2 pi i and for different harmonics this i can be 1 to and corresponding to i is equal to 1 we will get the maximum response and as the number of harmonics go on increasing this will uh, the effect will not be that large so you can see that i equal to 2 will result in lower velocity 
i is equal to 1 will be higher velocity. So the maximum velocity will occur when i is equal to 1 and then it will have the uh, resonance with the fundamental one and that is going to give us the most critical condition for the vibrations. Another thing you see here d has been used in no l is used. So I will explain this d later slightly later and uh, this is this has been actually calculated for uh, train of loads not for a single load so when the single load was there then l was appearing in the expression now this is the distance between the two loads which are repeating periodically so in case of a real train this is the length of a car of the train so one car of the train uh, this length is d so that means the load is the periodic load is repeating itself when the next car will come the same sequence of the loads will be repeated so it is being repeated at or after a distance d and the time will be simply d by vc so if we calculate d by vc that is the time after which the load will be repeating itself so critical speed we can calculate like this and this critical speed is crucial we have to avoid critical speed so we cannot allow or generally we will not allow the trains to move on a bridge at critical speed. So either we have to change the frequency of the bridge so that the critical velocity changes this omega 1 or we have to control the speed so that the resonance is not occurring or we have to use certain other vibration mitigation measures so that even at the resonance the displacement is controlled. We will talk about those measures also. Now, when the same beam is subjected to uh, multiple loads, let us say two loads in this case, and this distance between the loads is 10 meter, and uh, the span of the bridge is same, as in the previous case, 30 meter, then this uh, critical velocity is calculated, which comes out to be 36 kilometer per hour. So, if a car was running on this, with a, or a train was running with distance, of the cars between equal to uh, 10 meters the length of the car equal to 10 meters then the critical speed will come out to be 36 kilometer per hour and at 36 kilometer per hour this is the response you can see so here you will see that there is not a single wave there are multiple waves so here two waves are overriding each other so the first one is corresponding to the load movement on the span. So if the single load was moving along the span, we could have got one harmonic. Okay, now the second harmonic is coming because of these loads that because that after a time equal to 10 by V, next uh, load will come. So due to that, there is another frequency. It's overriding that. And after four seconds, the strain crosses the bridge roughly in four seconds. So after four seconds, it is rest to, it is put to free vibration. So you can see after that, there are free vibrations. And uh, if we look at this uh, behavior at some speed other than uh, uh, critical speed, so let us say 25 km per hour, which is not very far from 36 km per hour, but still it is not the resonating speed. So you can see here that the vibrations are quite damped out. The peak response when the load is moving on the uh, bridge has not been reduced that much, but you can see that the free vibrations after both the loads have crossed, those that has reduced uh, significantly. Because when the critical speed was there and when the first load leaves the uh, bridge and the bridge is subjected to uh, free vibrations, the free vibrations due to, due to the second load will start at a constructive interference. So the gap between them will be such that both are added. So it's like this that the bridge was moving, let us say, downward, and then the second load comes that also pushes it downward. So the displacement will go on increasing. On the other hand, if the bridge was moving upward and then the second, at that instant of time, the second load is entering. So in that case, what will happen? It will, the second load will oppose the motion of the bridge. And in that case, there will be destructive response, uh, 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 sorry, destructive uh, resonance. 
a destructive interference, uh, sorry, and in that case, this uh, response will reduce significantly. Now, this is the acceleration response, and we can see that the acceleration response goes on building with the time till four seconds when the load is on the bridge, and after that, it reduces because of the damping. It, it reduces free vibration phase is there, but you can see when the load is on the uh, bridge, the uh, acceleration is building up, getting added up in each cycle. So in each cycle, the acceleration goes on increasing till both the loads cross the bridge. Now this is a 36 km per hour at 25 km per hour, you can see that this building up of the response does not take place because the response due to the two loads is going to be out of phase and that those will cancel out each other. Now, another case study, that of a simply supported beam again. And uh, here the span is 20 meter and other details are also given. So there is a simply supported beam. And what is studied here, that how the peak response or the mid span response is varying with speed and with time. So the first one is showing the variation uh, with time. And uh, you can see that for the same bridge, when the load is moving, so you get a peak and then again it reduces and then there will be free vibrations after some period. So this is the mid span deflection of that bridge. And if we plot it with respect to the speed, and the speed has been uh, here normalized, so V into T Y L. So actually, it is giving uh, in terms of normalized speed. So you can see here the uh, wavy nature and uh, the uh, uh, amplitude is different in different cases and one more study has been done here that modal time history analysis has been performed and uh, modal time history uh, means that rather than doing the direct time into time step integration uh, for the bridge under the moving load it is considered as equivalent structures under different modes and uh, the results here are plotted for the single mode as well as for multiple mode with five modes. So you can see that the results of the single mode and corresponding multi-mode are very close. So these are following the same lines. So for example, here, this dotted line, this is representing this parameter S1 or uh, that is speed parameter capital omega 1 by small omega 1 as 0.1 and with single mode. And this is representing this S1 is equal to 0.1 with five modes. So you can see that the single mode and the five mode results are very close. So it again gives us an idea that in this case also, if we consider initial few modes, that uh, those are good enough. So if we, if the first mode itself is having uh, 80, 75, 80% uh, mass participation, then considering one mode itself is giving us good enough results. Uh, in other cases, we can consider more number of modes, uh, generally three or five modes are good enough. Uh, there is a criteria how many modes we should consider. We will discuss that also later in this uh, discussion. And the other observation is that the effect of damping or resonance uh, is there, but it is small. So when we are changing uh, the damping from let us say 0.5 to 1%, and you have to keep in mind that the damping under live load is going to be much smaller than the damping what we are using in case of earthquake. So in case of earthquake, we are used to have a damping of 5%. But when we are performing the analysis under uh, moving load, the damping will be much less. Here it has been done for 2.5. The results are shown for 2.5%. But actual damping under live load will be even small because the uh, uh, level of vibrations is small. The magnitude of vibrations is much smaller when as compared to uh, the uh, earthquake. And further, in case of earthquake, it is that pier which will be mainly deforming and which will yield. But in case of uh, moving loads, the superstructure will vibrate in the vertical direction. The pier will be more or less unaffected 
we can even ignore the peer and many a times we perform the analysis by putting the boundary conditions just boundary conditions at the top of the peer so the components which are participating in these two types of vibrations earthquake and moving load are different the level of uh, or the amplitude of vibrations is much lower in case of moving load as compared to earthquake and the materials are also different so that's why the damping is much different and it is actually of the order of 0.5 percent so what is seen here that if we make a little change in the damping the effect is not as sensitive as we are getting in case of earthquake and uh, if we consider uh, few mode then those few modes for mid span the first mode itself is good enough because the second and second mode will have a zero displacement so second mode will have this type of shape so at the center it is going to give us the zero displacement the second mode will not have any contribution at the midpoint but it will have a contribution at the other points so if i'm interested in uh, uh, finding out the displacement at let us say quarter length then the number of modes will be different and if I'm interested in finding out the response at the mid span, the number of modes may be different. The contribution by the same modes may be different. Then here, this is a plot with respect to speed parameter. And here it is the impact factor. So how we define impact factor? Impact factor is the ratio of dynamic displacement to the static displacement. So if I measure the displacement of the bridge at the center under moving load, and first I put it statically, so I will get a displacement and then I move that load at certain velocity and uh, that velocity can be represented in terms of this speed parameter S1, uh, corresponding one corresponding to the first mode. So it is capital omega one, that is the uh, frequency of the uh, loading function and with I is equal to one and small omega n, that is the frequency angular frequency of vibration of the bridge so if we take that ratio that is representing actually the increasing velocity so we can see here that initially the value of impact factor is very small then it increases and then at the resonance it becomes quite high so actually this impact factor you see as a point so it is showing only the uh, dynamic component that means the total dynamic response we are getting that total displacement under moving load condition minus the static displacement divided by static displacement that's how so the increase in the displacement will be 60 percent now if we compare this with our code we can see that in the initial range our code is having a value somewhere here so in the initial range of velocity that is valid but if the velocity is beyond certain level the same CDA value is not applicable. In that case, we have to go for dynamic analysis. The CDA analysis will not work there. Now, in reality, there is not a single load, but there is a train moving over the bridge. And when the train is uh, moving over the bridge, and train is not like just like a load, it is having its own stiffness, the arrangement of the wheels, the wheels are connected in a bogey and there is a suspension system between wheel and the bogey and then the bogey is connected to the car and the car is also uh, having uh, some suspension system some springs for that connection and then bogey itself can vibrate so we can see that the train itself is a dynamic system which is vibrating so we are doing a simplified analysis here where we are considering the train as certain moving loads, a series of moving loads. But in reality, train is not like that. So there will be an interaction between train and uh, bridge. So due to that interaction, this dynamic effect will be further amplified. Okay, But analyzing the bridge with considering train bridge uh, dynamic interaction is quite complex. I will explain you the procedure and then you can understand why, why it is so complex. So it is, it is quite complex. It can't be analyzed easily. So that's why most of the times we consider the train as the moving load and try to take into account the effect of train bridge interaction empirically. So some empirical expressions are available in literature by which you can further amplify 
the dynamic amplification factor or impact factor to take into account the effect of uh, train bridge interaction. Now, when train is moving uh, over the bridge, the wheel is actually moving over the rail and the rail is also not perfectly smooth. It also has certain irregularities. And due to that, the train will also be set into motion, vertical vibrations. And those vibrations will also be transmitted to the uh, bridge. Fortunately, the major component is due to the moving load effect. So because the wheel is moving over the bridge, that gives us the major component. And other effects, fortunately, can be taken care of using empirical relationships. So if we are thinking of uh, thinking from the point of view of uh, numerical modeling, then three types of models are used. One is the moving mass model, MM model is the moving mass model, moving force model, model MF, and uh, the moving system. So here we consider the train system. So we can consider that the simplest is this moving force model, where we consider that the train wheel is acting like a concentrated load, which is moving with time. Or we can consider that it is moving in a sinusoidal manner. So these are the two possibilities by modeling the train as uh, load and uh, the bridge will be modeled using grillage or finite element as we have discussed yesterday. So modeling of the bridge will remain more or less same except that it needs, uh, in case of uh, earthquake loading, we were not required to make this uh, or model the superstructure so finely, but here the superstructure needs to be meshed very finely so, so that the movement of the load can uh, take place smoothly from one point to the other. And it is also required from the convergence. But here we are not considering the mass of the train, but we understand when the train will be there, the mass of the bridge is also going to increase and that will affect the response. So even moving mass model, we consider the mass also, but we consider that this mass is attached to the uh, column, sorry, attached to the beam or the bridge. It can move in the horizontal direction, but it cannot move in the vertical direction relative to the beam. It will be connected. It is connected to the beam. So it takes into account the inertia effect of the uh, rail, uh, sorry, effect, inertia effect of the train, but it cannot consider the loose, uh, loss of contact if that is happening. So vibrations of the train itself are not considered, but the inertia force due to train, which is transferred to the bridge, that is considered. So it cannot simulate the dynamic behavior of trains uh, which are running on the bridge, but it can consider the effect of inertia on the bridge response. Here we do not consider, we consider neither the inertia nor the dynamic uh, train bridge interaction. So to consider the dynamic train bridge interaction, we have to model the train also with suitable spring mass and dashboard. So this is a dynamic system. So at each wheel level, there will be a dynamic system. So this dynamic system is to be modeled and then it is in contact with the rail or with the bridge. So this contact, between the wheel and the rail, that is also to be considered. And further, we have assumed the bridge without, so far when we were talking, we considered the bridge like a beam. But in reality, what will happen over a bridge, so especially when we are talking about railway bridge, there can be ballast. And above the ballast, there will be sleepers and there will be track. So train will be actually moving over the track. And from track, the vibrations will be transmitted to the bridge. So the flexibility of the track, rail, the flexibility of the ballast, that will also come into picture. So that stiffness also we need to model when we are performing a detailed uh, train bridge interaction. So in case of train bridge interaction, we have to model the rail car also, the train car also. And the train car is something like this. We have the wheels. So wheels can move and vibrate in different directions, then the wheels are connected to the bogey. So this is the bogey. And uh, between the bogey and the uh, wheels, there are spring and despots. So that we can model, uh, that we have to model in our 
uh, train system. Then bogey is connected to the car through again some springs and there is some uh, damping available. So due to that, we have to model another spring dashboard system here. And similarly, the other bogey, so let us say this is the front, front bogey. So front, there are two wheels uh, or two axles rather, four wheels in the big, in the uh, front of the car. And similarly, there are two wheels at two sets of wheels or uh, two axles at the rear end of the car. And between these, the car body can also vibrate. It can move. So it can move up and down. It can move, of course, horizontally and laterally, and it can rotate also. So all the types of motions are possible here. So we take into account this system. So this is one system, and we take the bridge along with its uh, piers, bearings, superstructure, then ballast above that. All this we model that becomes a uh, bridge system and then we will consider the contact of this with the bridge through this wheels. So these wheels will be in contact and sometimes if the acceleration of this car is larger, the wheel contact can be lost also. So uh, that uh, this wheel will not be transferring any vertical downward load. So this interaction we have to consider and uh, then we will get the exact results. Fortunately, this interaction does not have as significant effect as the moving load effect. So that's why most of the codes currently, UIC and uh, Euro code are the codes which provide uh, details, guidelines to perform this analysis. They allow a moving load analysis. So performing a uh, dynamic interaction analysis between the train car and the bridge is not necessary that is taken care of by using some empirical relationships. Now, the guidelines, the UIC and Eurocode guidelines, those provide how the analysis will be performed. So if I have to evaluate a bridge or I have to design a bridge for, let us say, some line speed, 100 kilometers or 200 kilometers or 220 kilometers, so it will be uh, the maximum speed which we have to consider in analysis should be 20% higher than the speed for which we are designing. So it should be checked that up to 1.2 times the speed. So for example, we want to increase the train speed on our existing network up to 200 kilometers. So we should check up to 240 kilometers that the resonance is not occurring. And if the resonance is occurring, we have to somehow mitigate the effect of the resonance so, so that the train can fly safely. Otherwise, there is a possibility if resonance is occurring uh, within that range, then there is a possibility that derailment can occur. The wheel can jump the rail. Then calculation should be made for a series of speeds. So we have to do analysis for a number of speeds because we have seen there are local peaks also with respect to speed. And uh, this speed should start from 40 meter per second, 144 kilometer per hour up to the maximum speed which we have considered 1.2 so below 144 km per hour the dynamic effects can be taken care of through cda so <clears throat> the cda value is valid up to 144 km per hour after that we should perform a nonlinear oh, sorry no, we should perform a dynamic analysis and using the results of the dynamic analysis we should get the response at different speeds and near the resonance, we should take smaller steps. Then uh, we have to consider there is variability in mass and uh, stiffness of the structure. So uh, we are estimating the mass, but actual mass which is there on the bridge may be slightly higher or lower than this. So uh, we have to consider a lower limit of the mass as well as an upper limit of the mass. So lower limit of the mass is giving us the maximum acceleration. So acceleration will be maximum when we are considering the mass on the lower side. And uh, when we are calculating the, we are estimating the lower limit on the mass, we will consider the dry and clean ballast. So the self-weight of the bridge components or the bridge superstructure can be calculated quite accurately because the sizes will be known. But there also, we should not make any assumption which is on the higher side, which is increasing the mass. So we have to consider the lowest possible mass, which may be acting. 
and then we have to also consider an upper limit of the mass because as the mass is increasing the frequency of vibration of the bridge is reducing and when the frequency of vibration of the bridge is reducing the resonance will occur at a lower speed so to obtain the lowest speed at which the resonance can occur we have to use an upper limit of the mass and in that case we will consider uh, the saturated uh, and dirty ballast because you might have you may be aware or you might have seen that uh, uh, when uh, the uh, railway tracks are laid on ballast it keeps on gathering some dust and uh, periodically that ballast needs to be cleaned so that ballast is cleaned and when the ballast is cleaned the dust is removed the weight over the bridge is going to reduce and when the dust is present and then suppose rain has also taken place this will retain this dust will retain water and due to that the mass of the uh, ballast is going to increase so that is one component which causes uh, uncertainty or variation in the mass similarly the variation of the mass in other component should also be considered and we should consider two limits one is the upper bound and another is the lower bound now regarding the stiffness we should always consider the upper bound estimates sorry if we consider the upper bound as estimates it will overestimate the natural frequency and if you are considering the lower bound estimates then it will uh, be uh, it it will be calculating or it will be resulting in the lower velocities uh, occurring the resonance because as the stiffness is increased the natural frequency of vibration of the structure is going to increase that means the resonance will occur now at higher velocity and uh, actual structure may be different and then this will be unsafe but when we are using lower bound estimate then we will be able to calculate the lowest velocity at which there is a possibility of resonance so we will be using a lower bound stiffness not a higher uh, upper bound estimate in case of uh, um, earthquake we are using upper bound estimates because we know from the shape of the response spectrum the earthquake forces are maximum when the stiffness or period is smaller period is shorter and the stiffness is maximum frequency of vibration is maximum but in case of moving loads when we are trying to estimate the resonating speed the situation is opposite to that so we have to use lower bound stiffness in this case then the third important parameter is damping so as i said that the damping which we are using under moving loads is very different than what we are using during earthquake so in case of earthquake we talk about damping like five percent or maybe two percent minimum in case of steel bridges so minimum two percent we are using but the damping which we are using in case of uh, moving load analysis that damping is much small so if the bridge is made of metal or composite then this damping is only 0.5 percent so we will be using only 0.5 percent so please note that this is in percent then if it is pre-cast pre-stressed concrete girder or it is encased steel girder or reinforced concrete then the damping can be slightly higher so in case of rcc bridges it can be taken up to rcc superstructure so please keep in mind in this case superstructure is participating in the vibrations so the damping will be decided by the material of superstructure not by the material of the substructure in case of earthquake the damping was decided by the material of pl whereas in case of uh, moving load the damping is decided by the material of the superstructure so if the superstructure is reinforced concrete then this damping can go up to 1.5% and if it is pre-stressed concrete because in pre-stressed concrete cracking will be less so less energy dissipation will take place and in that case the damping is one percent most of the cases when we are using truss bridges or composite girder bridges the damping to be used is only 0.5 percent now another important point related to our modeling is selecting the time step of integration because the results are very sensitive to the time step of the integration and the time step which we are commonly using in case of earthquake time history analysis those are much larger than the time stops which are required here so uh, one 
guideline is available in literature this errri uh, d214 commentary report we could find out where some guidelines are given so this should be equal to 1 over 8 f max where f max is the maximum frequency which we are using in modal analysis so we will be performing modal analysis and we will be considering some modes so initial three or five modes we may be considering and uh, these modes are having or these modes are in an order of increasing frequency so whatever maximum mode i am considering eight times of that will be considered for calculating the time step. so one over eight times of that frequency will be one limit on the time step and then whatever is the minimum span of the bridge because when we are performing analysis over a bridge there can be multiple spans so whatever is the span that divided by 200 into velocity velocity of motion so this l by 200 l by v that is giving us the td so the time step should be td by 200 so whole duration should be considered at least with uh, 200 time steps or here what we have l minimum that is the that is span divided by 4 and into v so where n is the number of modes which we are considering in the analysis so four times again this l by v is td so td divided by 4 into n that should be the time step and pine double zero one minimum of these that is the maximum limit on the time step so time step should be smaller than that so time step in any case is going to be less than pine double zero one whereas in case of earthquake analysis the time step which we are using in uh, uh, analysis are generally 0 0.05 sometimes people also use 0 0.01 but it is generally not recommended to use 0 0.01 because there may be numerical errors uh, in that case so 0 0.005 or minimum we go up to 0 0.001 but here 0 0.001 is the upper limit it has to be lower than that satisfying all these criteria then what we discussed so far was the effect of moving load so when the load is moving um, it is causing dynamic effects but there can be defects in the wheel there is a situation what we know as flat wheel so flat wheel happens when the wheel get distorted and due to that some portion and normally the wheel should be the train wheels should be circular perfect circular but there can be due, due to movement wear and tear there can be uh, either some flat portions or there may be some kinks so due to that there will be vibrations so similarly there can be irregularities in the track itself so uh, when we are having uh, we are connecting the track at the joint there is always an irregularity with the movement of the time the uh, uh, there may be settlement below the track and due to that there will be an irregularity so number of uh, such defects are possible in the wheel as well as in the rail or the track system as a whole which can cause uh, track irregularities and these track irregularities will cause or these these will excite the train to vibrate and more the train will vibrate more will be the dynamic effect so we need to consider this track irregularities also so for different types of maintenance conditions different uh, track irregularity levels uh, are to be considered so these track irregularities are considered of two types the long wavelength and the short wavelength so long wavelength are those which are occurring because of the let us say uh, depression of the track so when the track gets settled uh, due to some region uh, maybe due to settlement of the ballast over the bridge so that will be the long wavelength and uh, the local defects on the uh, track or the wheel those will give rise to the short wavelength irregularities so when we are performing the full train bridge interaction then we can consider these irregularities also but uh, in our normal analysis when we are considering the train load as forces only there we have to consider this effect empirically so this is what i was calling as the wheel uh, when the flat wheel condition is occurring 
So here you can see that the wheel has got distorted. Okay, so it, it has developed a flat shape. And whenever this will be coming, every, every cycle of rotation, it will cause some force over the track and that will be transmitted to the bridge. Then the track irregularity is like this one where the track is jointed. So here also when the wheel will come every time here, it will cause an impact. So that impact will give rise to additional dynamic response of the bridge. So these can be taken into account. It's, it's a little bit complex procedure. So these can be taken into account by considering their uh, power uh, spectrum. And uh, taking that power spectrum, we can develop a uh, set of irregularities which we can consider in our analysis. I'm not going into further details of this. And depending on the maintenance condition, uh, there are guidelines available. We can decide what, what is going to be the severity of these irregularities. Now, as we saw that in case of smaller velocities, the effect of moving load, the dynamic effect of the moving load is a small. And uh, Eurocode provides a flow chart in which we can decide that in which case the dynamic analysis is to be needed. So generally, uh, it will come out that for if we follow this chart that up to 140 to 160 kilometer per hour, the static behavior may be okay. Dynamic analysis may not be required, but for higher speeds, the dynamic analysis may be required. So that is speed, if we are designing a bridge, whether the dynamic analysis is needed or we can simply take CDA from the code, that can be decided using this flow chart. So it takes into account the velocity at which the train is moving, of course, then span, the natural frequency, bending frequency, and torsional frequency of the bridge. So the bridge can also vibrate about its longitudinal axis. So the torsional type of vibrations can also occur in, in the bridge. So this torsional frequency is also considered. Then some charts are available to calculate the natural frequency limits. So when we are designing a bridge, we should ensure that the natural frequency should not fall below this value. So uh, if the natural frequency of the bridge is between these two lines here, so here it is the span and here it is the natural frequency. So you can see that there is an upper limit and the lower limit. So if our natural frequency is within this range, we need not to uh, perform the uh, dynamic analysis. Otherwise, if it is outside, we have to perform the dynamic analysis of the bridge. Okay, so this expression here needs uh, L5. Okay, so L5 is to be calculated. And this L5, for calculating this L5, the tables are available in UIC. So these tables gives the value of L5 for different conditions. Okay. Now, I want to discuss the code provisions, what different codes say about uh, calculation and acceptance of these uh, vibrations due to moving load or uh, due to moving train. So, two criteria are there. One is regarding the passenger's comfort and strength of the structure. So, uh, the speed should be limited so that the passengers are not feeling discomfort and the other is regarding running safety. So if the train is running at a high speed and the wheels jump due to large vertical acceleration, the wheels jump the track, then there will be derailment. So that is an issue of running safety. So based on these two uh, criteria, uh, the guidelines are given. So from the passenger comfort, uh, this chart is given where we have here span and here we have L by delta. So this delta is the displacement, vertical displacement, which is occurring under the load and L is the span. So L by delta or what percentage of the span we can allow as uh, the displacement that is given by this chart. So at different velocity, this chart is there. And you can see that for particular value of L at each speed, at particular value of L, this L by delta 
is large. Large alveoli delta means that we are permitting a smaller displacement. So you can see that at certain speed, there is a peak and it is reducing towards left as well as towards right. So we have to calculate, uh, we have to limit our speed within these values. So or if the speed is known, we have to design our structure, our bridge in such a way that the alloy delta is within this range. So this alloy delta we can calculate and we can ensure in our design. Now, um, passenger comfort depends on the vertical acceleration. So this vertical acceleration needs to be controlled. We can calculate the vertical acceleration directly using uh, uh, modeling, numerical analysis in the vertical direction under moving load. So different values which are acceptable are also given by UIC and the same has been uh, taken in Euro code. So comfort will be very good if the vertical acceleration is less than one meter per second square. It is acceptable up to two meter per second square, but if the vertical acceleration exceeds two meter per second square, that is 0.2 G, it is unacceptable from, for the passengers. Passengers will feel discomfort if this acceleration is more than that. Then from the running safety point of view, we are checking the deck acceleration. We are checking the vertical displacement. So uh, there are different parameters which can affect the running safety. Deck acceleration, the vertical acceleration as we have discussed from passenger comfort point of view also, that is most important here because at higher acceleration, the wheel is going to jump the track. Then vertical displacement and end rotation is also important because I will I will explain with the help of a figure that how the end rotation is also uh, maybe also responsible for uh, jumping of the train from the wheel, jumping of the train from the track. So the vertical acceleration limits in case of velocity track, it is 0.35 g or 3.5 meter per second square. And in case of uh, non velocity track, it is 0.5 g. So up to 0.35 G and 0.5 G, we can go from the, uh, the running safety point of view. But same is not acceptable, may not be acceptable uh, from the point of view of passenger comforts. The limits for passenger comforts are much smaller. So even if we ignore the passenger comfort in the extreme case, even then it should not exceed 0.5 G because if the vertical acceleration is exceeding 0.5 G, there is a possibility that the train may jump the track. So you have to keep in mind this 0.5G when we are obtaining, this is being obtained using moving load uh, model, not considering the uh, train bridge interaction. So additional effect will come due to the vibration of the train itself. That's why this value is limited 0.5G. Ideally, the separation should occur when the vertical acceleration is 1G. So when the vertical acceleration is 1G, there will be a gap occurring between the uh, wheel and the rail. Now, vertical displacement and end rotation. So vertical displacement and rotation, you can understand from this. So when there is a vertical rotation, when our bridge is deforming like this, so this is the end of the gutter is shown. So is a small portion near the end is shown here. You can see that a rotation will come here. And due to this rotation, there will be a displacement. So this displacement needs to be controlled. Larger this displacement, more impact and hence the more vibrations of the uh, train we are expecting. So the limit for this delta H is given in Euro code and UIC. So it should not be it, the limit. It is limited up to 10 millimeter. So how we can obtain this delta H? So I will calculate the end rotation. So the slope, suppose I'm modeling it using a beam, then the slope of that beam at the support, I can get that is theta, theta multiplied by the thickness of this beam, height of this beam, that will give me delta H. Then this angular rotation and LH, these are also given in Chinese code. So you may be aware that the Chinese have uh, done a lot of work on high speed trains. So, and they have developed a lot of literature also. Only problem is that uh, it is difficult to get that in English language. So, uh, 
So what you see here when this is rotating, you can see that the sand will lift up and a gap will be created here. So depending on this LH, larger the LH, the overhang here, more uplift and more displacement will occur here. And of course, theta 1 and theta 2 are going to govern that. So limit on theta is given for abutment. It is because in abutment there is no element on the other side. So it is 0 0.02. And in case of pier, both theta 1 and theta 2 should less be should be less than 0 0.04. And individually, uh, it is uh, 0 0.015. If LH is 550 meter, this uh, sorry 550 millimeter. This has to be small. So if it is less, it is about half meter projecting from the center line of the bearing. So if it is up to half meter roughly, then it is 0 0.015. And if it is uh, increasing, then we can see that this limit goes on decreasing. So actually this is the displacement which is occurring here at the free end that is uh, responsible for uh, the problems in running safety. So this LH is important and how much rotation we will allow will depend on this LH. Then uh, for track stability, there is a limit on longitudinal displacement. So you may be wondering that whether a longitudinal displacement will also occur uh, in case of train moving. Yes, so when the train is moving due to the traction and braking effect, there will be a movement in the rail. And how much movement will be there? That will depend upon the stiffness of the pier of the bridge. So if we have a stiffer pier bridge, then the displacement is going to be less. And otherwise, this displacement will be more. So that displacement also needs to be controlled because if that displacement of the bridge due to its flexible substructure is more, the track will buckle. So this limit in millimeters on the displacement which is caused due to uh, braking or traction that is given. So another important issue is the tack distortion. So I told you that the torsional motion of the bridge is also important. So what happens, it is the bridge is torsionally stable at the end because we are having bearings at both the ends. But when the load is applied eccentrically, let us say it is a multi-track bridge and the train is moving only at the at one break. So what will happen? In between it will get distorted. So that distortion one end will deflect more as compared to the other. So this type of uh, deformation is called distortion. So there is a limit on that distortion also and uh, distortion is measured as because it is an angle. So it is measured as millimeter per meter. So here we take a uh, patch of 3 meter, a segment of 3 meter and on that segment of 3 meter we calculate how much is the relative displacement of opposite diagonal uh, or diagonally opposite corners and that displacement there is a limit depending upon the speed. So larger the speed less should be the distortion, less distortion should be allowed from the, from the point of view of uh, rail wheel contact because if the bridge is deforming too much uh, this is having a uh, distortional deformation, then there is a possibility that a gap between the track and the wheel is created and the train may jump the wheel. Derailment can occur. Then the other important issue is that we have to suppress the resonance. So we discussed that the resonance occurs when this SN is equal to uh, this value and this SN depends on the velocity. So we can see that the velocity of train is coming here. It also depends on a span. The span is also there. It is depending on mass and stiffness. And of course, the response will depend upon damping. So uh, damping uh, is not appearing here in SN because this is giving us the velocity at which resonance will occur. But how much response will occur at resonance, that will depend upon damping. So that's why the damping is also important. So the choices which are available to us, we can't change the velocity because that will be decided. Uh, that is a policy decision that for what uh, velocity we want to design. A span of the bridge may be mostly available. Mass will come, whatever we are getting from the calculation. What we can change is the stiffness and damping. So we can stiffen our bridge to increase its uh, regenerating frequency and uh, then the resonance will be suppressed or we can add damping devices, supplemental 
energy dissipation devices so that it dissipate that energy which will be transferred to this uh, during resonance. Then in case of stiffening, we can either do, or we can add a new member or we can, uh, uh, we, we can enhance the stiffness of existing member. And uh, in case of, I mean, one of the uh, methods which we have been that uh, by increasing the mass also, we can reduce the acceleration. Acceleration is uh, for all given conditions. If other things, other parameters are given, increasing mass results in lower acceleration. But when we are increasing the mass, the acid, you we can see, uh, which is giving the speed, the critical speed. So critical speed is also going to reduce. So now the resonance will start occurring. So there may be smaller uh, response, but the speed at which resonance will occur will increase. So this is generally not used. This method is not used. And uh, this stiffening method, whatever stiffening we are doing, it will put extra mass over the foundation because finally the weight of that additional members also to be transferred to the ground and that will be done through the foundation. So maybe the foundations which were initially designed for uh, uh, some speed using CDA. So those foundations may not be adequate for this additional mass due to stiffening members. Now, in case of railway bridges, where a DAX lab is not there, providing of a DAX lab is the most common solution. So when we provide the DAX lab over the steel girders, which are already existing, we can see that the moment of inertia increases, the strength also increases. So when the moment of inertia is increasing, is increasing, the stiffness will increase. And when the stiffness will increase, the frequency is going to increase and the uh, velocity of the train at which uh, resonance will take place, that velocity is also going to increase. And it has certain other advantages also. It uh, protects, it covers the steel from the top. So steel girders are protected from the top and that's why the corrosion will be reduced. And it also helps in noise cal calculation. So when we have uh, integrated uh, the slab with the uh, girders and then the track will be moving on the slab, it will have less noise. And disadvantage is because this is a major uh, problem uh, that the concrete is to be put on, concrete is to be done on existing structures, so it, it is going to be difficult. And uh, when we are uh, connecting, we are providing the slab at the top of the steel girders, there has to be a shear connection between these girders and the slab. And for that, some studs are to be welded at the top flange of the existing girder. So those studs, when we are welding, it may cause some damage uh, in the bridge sometimes, and that may uh, cause damage to the bridge as a whole. Then uh, uh, both the methods, whether it is increasing uh, adding a member or uh, adding a slab at the top these require much intervention and uh, for performing these operations we have to stop the traffic movement along with traffic we can't do it so one more type of uh, this method by which we can enhance the stiffness of existing bridges by providing arch under the bridge. So an arch under the bridge is provided and that arch is supporting the bridge and hence the stiffness is going to increase. And when the stiffness is increasing, the velocity at which resonance will occur, that will also increase. Then we can use dampers. So dampers are not increasing the uh, stiffness, but these are reducing the response of the bridge at resonance and uh, different types of dampers you might have already heard so three commonly type of dampers used are or rather four i will say one is the friction damper which are dissipating energy through friction 
Then we have the viscous fluid dampers, which contains a viscous fluid inside a piston cylinder arrangement. And uh, when the piston moves inside the cylinder, the viscous fluid moves from one chamber to the other. And as a result, energy is converted into heat or what we call energy gets dissipated. So different types of such uh, dampers are possible. And uh, in, when we are using dampers, the reliability is much higher. Uh, we uh, are more confident about their functioning because these are going to work under moving loads. These are generally much cheaper as compared to other options. And these are simple to install. We have to just connect it at the two ends on the bridge. And uh, even the stopping of traffic may not be needed. The disadvantages are that any change in the load pattern, okay, which changes the forcing frequency, that can uh, change the performance of these dampers, especially the tuned mass damper. So the different types of dampers which we can use in bridges to reduce their response under uh, high speed trails. These are the four different types of dampers. The most commonly used is tuned mass damper and tuned mass damper is having this property. It, it works like a two degree of freedom system and it has a property that when the frequency of the forcing function matches with the primary system, then the secondary system comes into play. Secondary system takes all the energy. The secondary system dis, uh, dissipates all the energy and the primary system is put to rest. So in our case, this is the situation in resonance. So when the forcing frequency is equal to uh, the frequency of the primary structure, so that is the resonance frequency. And actually we are trying to avoid or mitigate the effects at that frequency only. So we can put just a second system, which is having the same frequency as the uh, frequency of uh, vibration of the primary system. So the primary system is also having the same frequency. The secondary system is also having the same frequency and the forcing function is also having the same frequency. So that type of situation will occur when we are having uh, resonance conditions. So that resonance condition can be mitigated through these. And these uh, dampers, this type of dampers, because this consists of only a spring and mass. So a spring of known stiffness, of controlled stiffness, is to be installed uh, along with a mass. So these are much cheaper and these require much less maintenance also. Then a tuned mass damper uh, do not get enough time to start, so which can affect their efficiency. So the vibrations will start, uh, those, those will take some time to start. Sorry. Yeah. So that is one disadvantage. And then another problem is that with time, the dynamic characteristics of the bridge can change and the dynamic characteristics of the tuned mass damper may also change. So there will be detuning. So we will see that these tuned mass dampers work only when their frequency is matching with the frequency of the structure. If there is a detuning, then uh, its effect will be lost. So to avoid this detuning, we use multiple tuned mass dampers, not one, but multiple with slight difference in the frequency. So when we are doing that with slight difference in the uh, frequency, so even if the frequency of the structure is changing a little bit, it will be taken care of by some of the uh, tuned mass damper, which we have done. There is another advantage of tuned mass damper, which I will talk about slightly later. So this, as I said, this is nothing but a two degree of freedom system. We can write down the equation of motion in the form of a matrix, and then we can solve it. And after solving, we will get these relationships. So the displacement of the primary system is given by U1 naught, and uh, the peak displacement of the secondary system is given by this U2 naught. So this is representing the peak displacement. And here the frequency three, uh, two frequencies, omega one for primary system and omega two for the secondary system and the mass ratio mu, these are important. So mass ratio, the frequency of the two 
through uh, two uh, systems and the mass ratio. Okay, so from these expressions, we can see that this u1 will tend to zero when this one minus omega by omega two square becomes zero. So when omega two becomes equal to omega one, so, and that is equal to omega, the forcing frequency. So at the forcing frequency, this numerator will become zero, and that's why this u1 will become zero. So when this term becomes zero, u1 zero, u1 naught is zero. And this is the condition when omega 2 is equal to omega. So vibration of the primary mass and the secondary mass both are occurring at the frequency omega, that is of the frequency of the forcing function. And then uh, tuning of the uh, vibration absorber, which is having frequency omega 2, uh, gets with the external frequency. So omega 2 is also equal to omega. And uh, at resonance, when omega is equal to omega, we are going to get the maximum response in absence of the secondary system. Now it will become almost zero because of this tuning effect. Then we have friction dampers. In friction dampers, as you know, it works on the principle of friction. It is dissipating the energy. So these can be added additionally to our bridge. Then we have viscoelastic uh, dampers where between two plates, the viscoelastic material is used and it is giving us the elastic behavior as well as energy dissipation. And this flood, fluid viscous damper, which I was talking. So idea is to dissipate the energy, which is imparted by the moving uh, vehicles over the bridge. We can dissipate this energy. So tuned mass dampers have been used in a very large number of uh, bridges. If you go to the Google and search, you will find that a large number of bridges have been fitted with these tuned mass dampers. Uh, it also has one role, uh, only not only under the moving load, but it has its role under the earthquake as well as under uh, other loads like the wind. So in case of cable street bridge, bridges, we use these uh, dampers, different types of dampers, maybe friction or viscous dampers to mitigate the vibrations of uh, the cables. So to avoid excessive cable vibration also, these can be used. So I have a few case study. This first case study is of uh, one bridge, which is 40 meters long, composite. It is ballasted and high speed. This is to be uh, evaluated and retrofitted for high speed railway. So what we see that the first bending frequency is 3.2 hertz. The second bending frequency is 9.6 and the torsional frequency is 3.5 hertz. So the critical speed can be calculated like this, which comes up to 231 kilometer per hour in this case. So the critical speeds at which it can occur will be 231, that is the most critical situation where the primary uh, frequency or the primary mode is uh, matching with that, that of the forcing function, that is the moving load. Or when the moving load frequency, a higher harmonic of moving load frequency is matching with this. So half of this, this is one third of this, okay, one fourth of this. So as we go on, uh, so fourth harmonic of this speed is going to, uh, when 57.5 kilometer speed is there, we will have some peak in the response, although this peak will not be as large as in case of primary uh, uh, resonance, which will occur at 231 km per hour. So 231 km per hour is going towards the primary and primary resonance and the secondary resonances, which will occur at smaller speed. Uh, and these speeds will be just half or one third uh, numerical, uh, numerically, uh, I mean, uh, these uh, speeds will be in a multiple of uh, what we have as the primary speed. So half of this, one third of this, and one fourth of this, and so on. But the peak response under these speeds will go on reducing. So it may not be, although a peak will be observed, but this peak of uh, response may be well within limits. Problem is there when we are having this primary resonance. 
So for the considered bridge, if you see the train speed versus maximum acceleration, it goes like this. And at 231 km per hour here, we are getting the peak response, and which is much more than the maximum allowed acceleration from different criteria. So we have taken the limit uh, based on the criteria which we were considered earlier. So the limits are like this, that the vertical acceleration should not be more than 0.35 G and the mid span displacement should be within LY800. So if we look at the maximum acceleration, this is exceeding. But if we are looking at the maximum uh, displacement, that is well within the limit, LY800. So uh, it is within that limit for this bridge, but the acceleration is exceeding. So we need to do something to minimize this acceleration. So different uh, alternative methods are suggested here. So this is the primary response at the resonance. So we can see that the response goes on building. So if we put a single tuned mass damper, which is uh, tuned with the peak, uh, with the resonance, frequency, primary resonance frequency of the bridge, then we can see that this peak reduces significantly. Here there is a significant reduction and it comes well within the limits, but at the nearby frequencies, here you can see at these frequencies, the response has actually increased. Earlier it was lower, now it has been increased and it has exceeded the limit. So we need to do something for here. Same thing we see here in the displacement. So similar effect will be there on the displacement as well. So to take care of these additional peaks, we do multiple, we use multiple tuned mass dampers. So one tuned mass damper will take care of the reduction of the peak and then the secondary peaks which have generated. To reduce these, we need additional dampers, uh, sorry, tuned mass dampers which will mitigate this peak and that peak. So different number of uh, tuned mass dampers can be used. Here, uh, in this study, one, that is a single tuned mass damper, three and five tuned mass dampers have been used and the response, numerical response has been obtained with these dampers. And when we are providing multiple dampers, the frequency range which we want to cover and the frequency displacement or frequency gap between adjacent uh, dampers is necessary. So this delta omega is the total frequency range which we want to cover. And then the frequency of ith damper, we can calculate like this. Okay. And for optimal parameters, people have done some study and they have also suggested that what frequency uh, uh, cap we should consider and uh, what value of uh, damping etc we, we should use. So what we need, what we want to discuss here is that what response is obtained after performing this. So when we perform, uh, we provide a three TMD pair, uh, three TMDs on the bridge and uh, with this frequency difference, 5, 10, and 15, and 20 percent. So from the peak frequency, the frequency corresponding to the peak, we take a range of 5 percent, 10 percent, 15 percent, 20 percent. So for those ranges, these are the frequency ratios which have been estimated uh, using the formula in the previous sheet. And uh, what we get here, this is the response under single TMD. This is the response we see. So this first one is the uh, what is going above that is without TMD. And these are the multiple TMD with mass ratio of 1.5 and d omega, the difference in the frequency as 5%. So like that we can see. So response has been now when we are using uh, three tuned mass dampers, the response has reduced in a larger range of the velocity. And in this case, also it is slightly higher, but in this case, we can see that this is perfectly below. So we have to understand that in case of uh, multiple tuned mass dampers, we have to perform some sensitivity analysis so that we can identify the most optimum uh, configuration. Then 
we can have the viscous fluid dampers also so there is a case study on the viscous fluid dampers also where the dampers have, can be connected like this and uh, these will take care of the vibrations which are occurring in the bridge these will damp out so this analysis procedure i am skipping because i want to stop here so that we have some time for the questions so we cover uh, uh, i mean other slides you can see uh, when the pdf will be made available to you and these are self explanatory you can understand from there i have uh, done the initiation i have given the background with that background you can understand the issues and uh, analysis procedures under moving load and in the afternoon uh, mohit will be um, demonstrating how uh, the dynamic analysis under different types of trains can be performed on given bridges real bridges so bridges also have been taken from uh, rdso standard drawings and then the standard train uh, systems have been run including uh, high speed trains and then we will see that how uh, the response at the resonance is occurring and can we mitigate it thank you so i will stop sharing and now we can take up the questions so if any question has come i i could i could see that some questions were popping up so we can take those questions one by one yeah we can start with the questions thank you sir uh, first question we have is from jay uh, he's asking does the formula for calculating the critical speed is applicable irrespective of the bridge type that is integral continuous okay so uh, in that critical speed formula omega 1 is appearing and omega 1 is the frequency of vibration of the bridge and frequency of vibration of the bridge will depend not only on its span but also on the boundary conditions so omega 1 for the same span of the bridge when the bridge is simply supported is going to be different and when it is continuous bridge that is going to be different so omega 1 will take care of that so the critical speed will come out to be different for a continuous bridge and it will come out to be different for a simply supported and uh, for, uh, what is the contribution of the substructure and the foundation stiffness to the response of the bridge uh, in dynamic analysis of moving bridge? So under moving load, the level of vibrations is very small. So the deformations uh, which are occurring in soil or uh, pier can be neglected. So most of the times we can model only superstructure and the contribution of the substructure can be ignored because those are very stiff. Uh, we know uh, um, that any member in axial direction is very stiff. So here it is a superstructure which is bending uh, and the piers are acting in the axial direction. So those deformations are quite small. Those can be most of the cases. Those can be neglected. Uh, Mr. Manish is asking, what number of modes shall be considered for dynamic analysis? Uh, single mode or five mode or as per UIC seven seven six two R, that is modes up under thirty years. Yeah. So we will be talking about more details. So there is a criteria for that. We should have sufficient number of modes and uh, at least up to thirty years. So that is one of the criteria. So those modes we should consider, we should have frequency up to 30. And generally in the bridge, five, three to five modes will satisfy that criteria. But if in some bridge, even after considering five modes, the highest frequency we are getting is less than 30. So we have to go for larger number of modes. Uh, Mr. Pranav is asking whether component level excavation is also required to be checked in dynamic analysis, for example, expenditure and cross beam in case of open web kernel. Okay, so um, not the acceleration of, of the member level is needed, but uh, we will need the forces at the member level because when we will be performing uh, uh, fatigue analysis and uh, Professor Ashwin Kumar is going to take up immediately after this lecture. So uh, the moving load is also responsible for the fatigue. And for fatigue also, we need the time history of stress. And for that time history, we need to record the response of uh, individual components. So individual component response will be required from the point of view of fatigue. And there we are interested in the forces. So forces will be needed. Uh, Mr. Abhishek is asking, 
uh, this question is uh, regarding that detuning thing that you discussed uh -huh. uh, for designing uh, of bridges. At how many minimum time instances should dynamic analysis be conducted with varying stiffness? That is due to change in the material properties or corrosion while striking a balance between accuracy and computational. So here the uncertainty is in the properties, not in the moving load. So moving load, the train load is fixed. So the time stream will be one depending upon whatever uncertainties you are expecting, whatever uncertainties you want to take into account in the structure those many models you have to prepare with varying properties and you have to run the analysis but you need to run only one analysis for one train because here the train is fixed it is different than earthquake in case of earthquake no single time history uh, is representing the conditions actual conditions which are going to occur at our site but here the train remains same so there is there need not to be done uh, multiple analysis for the same train uh, means uh, you can just uh, account for the change in property with the number of years and uh, according to okay. the I mean, it, it depends upon the designer that what uh, properties he or she wants to take into account. Then Mr. Jay is asking, uh, D represents the car length or the spacing between the excel within the car length or between adjacent cars in TD by T. So, it is actually car length. So in each car, there will be two bogies. The uh, one bogie at the front, one bo bogie at the rear end. And then in the next car, again, there will be a bogie at the front and the bogie at the rear end. And the distance between the front and, sorry, the rear uh, bogie of the first coach and the front bogie of the second coach will be different than what we are getting between this. So it is to be considered as the car length. So that is representing the time by which the bogey as a whole is going to be repeated. So the frequency will come from here. After one bogey, whatever load is coming from one bogey, the second bogey will come. But it is a complex phenomena. We are not having only one frequency here. Because of these different distances, different frequencies will, will be coming. Okay, sir. Uh, in moving load analysis, numerically, how breaking is applied? Say at mid span of the bridge, I want to apply braking. How in equation of motion it will get reflected? No, braking is not uh, in uh, is a not a dynamic force. Braking we are considering as a static force. So the braking and traction these are considered as a static longitudinal force. Yes, sir. Your voice is not clear. It appears okay. now somebody has opened the microphone. Okay, let's go ahead. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chandra is asking the optimal TMD parameters provided by Den Hartog were for undamped system. Are there any standards regarding using optimal parameters for the TMD? See, those are also tentative values. So for your case, you have to perform your own numerical analysis. A sensitivity analysis and when you are performing your sensitivity analysis you will be uh, considering the damping of your bridge also so you have to check it whatever parameters are there you have to cross check those parameters you have to modify those parameters a little bit based on your sensitivity analysis and in that sensitivity analysis you will be using damping but i have not come across uh, a closed form solution or a guideline empirical guideline like that taking into account the damping also uh, uh, we'll take the last one then uh, because okay. uh, we have a 10 minute break also. Sir. Okay. So, Mr. Navar is asking Do we need to consider moving loads along with earthquake loads? Uh, not yet. At the moment, the courts uh, do not say that. So, when we are considering uh, the effect of the uh, moving load live load we are not considering its dynamic effects okay but theoretically yes maybe sometime in future the code will be clear on this issue that uh, moving load what will happen when the train is moving and there is a either a uh, high paint or there is a uh, major earthquake 
when the train is moving. So behavior under that condition is very, very complex. Perhaps we are not considering that condition at the moment in our design, when the train is also moving on the bridge at a high speed and the earthquake strikes at that. So there is full possibility of derailment at that time. Sir, probably the last one, uh, if we yeah. are okay with it, sir. I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay. So in that issue, TD by TN, TN represents the fundamental word, fundamental vertical frequency or time period. For different bridge types and articulations, do we see similar behavior of high response when TD by TN is around 0.5 to 1.5? Yes. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, the first it, there were two questions. The first question was regarding uh, what this TN is. So TN is the period of vibration, not the frequency. It is period of vibration of, uh, although period of vibration is uh, inverse of frequency. So the angular frequency we are representing by omega one and the period we are representing either by T1 or TN. So it is the fundamental period of vibration of the structure. And what was the second question? Okay, that was regarding that whether we will get the peak in that range, yes. So the common type of, uh, it, it will of course depends upon the shape of the pulse also. Uh, so for the common types of pulse, the triangular pulse and uh, half sine wave pulse, which I have shown. So for that, it is occurring in that range. But if the shape of the pulse changes, it, it may be different also. Okay, good. Uh, that's all the questions we are going to take. Now we'll have to take a break for 11.30 sessions. Okay, so at 11.30, uh, Professor Ashwin Kumar will join and he will talk about fatigue analysis under moving loads. Okay, so we will break. Thank you.